recording this webinar. Um, but we should have the webinar available for folks after, which is why we record it. So, um, great, we have a, a lot of people showing up today. This is Danielle Varda. I'm um, the director of the Center on Network Science at the University of Colorado, Denver, at the School of Public Affairs. And this is our monthly webinar series um, on network leadership from the field, linking the research to practice. Um, we do this webinar series about once a month and welcome uh, mostly our practice community and, and some others to help us think about, learn about, and hear about what they're doing out in the field and how it might relate to things that we are also doing in our, in our own communities. Today, I am really pleased to uh, announce our webinar, Network Knowledge Mapping, Mapping the Known, Discovering the Unknown. Um, just a quick note, uh, we do always encourage folks to share what they're learning or thoughts about it. Um, one way we do that is with a, a hashtag, um, network leaders and so that's one way to kind of stay connected over time as well and maybe tune in during different um, webinars. So um, uh, I like to get started by saying what is network leadership and why are we talking about it? One reason that um, we do these kinds of webinars out of our center is because we know that many people today are deeply involved in networks but still struggling to find information and tools for building those, building those knowledge and skills. So we try to uh, provide ways for people to learn from one another and, and develop kind of our own network of thinkers. We call this work network leadership. We believe it's a network leadership, uh, a leadership framework where members of networks, so we, we emphasize that not just leaders of networks, but all members of networks can build skills to use data to make decisions. Um, we do this out of the, the, the center, and it's part of our mission to make sure that we provide research skills and practices for engaging in what um, we've learned to call the network way of working. Um, and just before we get started, I wanted to just go over a couple of, of things that we hope will uh, keep you interested. Our next webinar is set for December 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. It is uh, titled Evaluating the Development of a Network of Services and Support for Children and Families in Chittenden County, Vermont. Um, Lee Lefebvre and Naomi Clemens will be our presenters on that, and we're just really excited to hear uh, their presentation and what they've been doing in Vermont. In January, January, we're going to have another webinar called the Le Innovative Leadership Network, a network approach to foster engagement, leadership, and innovation within public sector agencies. And uh, really pleased to say that the National Park Service and a U.S. Park Ranger and some of their team members are going to be describing um, the network efforts uh, within the National Park Service, which we just think is really neat. And of course, we'll have other webinars throughout the spring um, that we, you know, will continue to post about. Uh, we'd like to remind everyone that we have announced our dates for our Network Leadership Training Academy uh, for 2017. So we've settled on the dates of April 26th to 28th, and we hope that if you are so available and inclined that you will join us in Denver for three days of this kind of thinking where we can um, all come together and, and think about ways to engage in network leadership, um, learn new skills. We've got a really exciting program this year, um, and a lot of the people who join us on these webinars will be there, so it's a nice place to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, and just lastly, before I uh, introduce everyone, we realize this might be a good time after especially some of the last few webinars where folks have asked us about some of the tools uh, that we mentioned um, that come out of the center. So we just want to make sure folks are aware that we do, we are the, the managers and authors of the partner tool, which is a social network analysis tool. Um, we hope our mission with the, the partner tool is that we are providing something to help build capacity in communities to kind of think about how to measure and analyze networks. And we welcome people to to find that tool and its resources there. Uh, we're really excited about our uh, new tool that we will be launching um, sometime later this fall, early winter, called the Patient-Centered Network App, which is a provider assistance screening tool, which is assesses gaps and strengths in personal support systems, and then links people to community resources all through uh, that device. So um, that's something we have a, we'll probably do a webinar on at some point to, to tell people more about it. 
But without further ado, I'd really love to um, introduce, and I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers today. Dr. Bernadette Wright is um, one, she is the Director of Research and Evaluation at Meaningful Evidence. She provides consulting and workshops to help nonprofit leaders assess, design, and improve their programs and strategies using both program evaluation and strategic knowledge mapping. Um, as many of you on the phone might recognize, she's an active member of the American Evaluation Association and its affili affiliate, Washington Evaluators. And most of her research experience includes studies in healthcare, human services, aging and disability, education, STEM, and race relation issues. So very pleased to have Bernadette today and I'd also like to introduce Dr. Steve Wallace who is the director of meta-analysis at Meaningful Evidence, organization development consultant providing collaborative facilitation to businesses and nonprofits in Northern California. Um, Dr. Wallace has developed a groundbreaking tool to help advance more useful social research integrative propositional analysis. Um, he provides workshops and consulting to help organizations use the IPA tool to shape high lever leverage research, improve collaboration and plan strategies. Um, his publications cover a wide range of interdisciplinary fields, including ethics, science, management, organizational change, and policy. So as you can see, our two speakers today are both um, experts and have a lot of experience in, in this work. And we are just so excited today to, to, that they've agreed to, to be a part of our webinar series. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bernadette and Steve who are going to now share their screen and, and take it away. The last thing I, wanted, I do want to say is um, the way that we, we do do this is that we have a Q&A. So if you are uh, messing with your mouse on your screen, if you go to the top, a bar, some, for some people it's on the bottom, a bar will pop up. There's a little Q&A button, and we encourage you to put your questions in there. And at the end of the webinar, when, when the presenters are done, we will moderate a Q&A session. If you have a question or comment, particularly about technology or having trouble with the webinar, we'd really love you to put that in the chat box. And um, that way we can just kind of deal with a little bit of the, the technical help that you might need along the way. So um, please be sure to queue up those Q&As as we're, we're going through this. And we'll be doing some polls and um, you know, that ways, other ways for you to kind of stay engaged and interact. So, so Steve, if you are ready, you can go ahead and grab the screen. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, let's see if I can get this right here. Sure. Um, there there we go. go. Wonderful. Yep. Uh, thank Perfect. you so much for your wonderful introduction, Danielle, and uh, welcome to each and every one of our participants. I see we have more than uh, 100 people here uh, from across the country and some from around the world. Uh, I want to take uh, you know, just a moment to help myself focus and perhaps uh, yourselves as well. Um, you know, we had a, a bit of an election last night and it signaled the end of a pretty wild political season and some people are happy with the results and others aren't so happy. Whatever your political perspective though, I strongly suspect that we share a common belief, uh, you know, an understanding that we have to move forward together to find better ways to understand our situation with greater clarity, to manage our organizations with greater effectiveness, uh, to achieve our goals. And so with, with that, uh, a deep breath, and let's all focus on, because that's, that's really why we're here today. And your networked organizations are tackling really hard to solve problems uh, and achieving some pretty ambitious goals. And uh, I see we have attendees uh, working towards excellence in public health, education, international development, just to name a few of the really wide variety of fields uh, people are coming from today. And to solve those big problems, you need good knowledge uh, about what others have done, their strategies, and what ineffective approaches that you might you know, want to avoid. So what we're going to talk about today is a network knowledge map, which is a scientifically rigorous approach that your organizations or coalitions can use to bring together knowledge from various sources 
to discover new insights that you can apply in practice. And a knowledge map is also useful for demonstrating the value of your organization to funders and other stakeholders. So let's do a quick poll if we could, just, just a quick yes or no answer. Uh, have you done any sort of mapping before? Um, whether using a partner tool, logic model, or any other kind of mapping. So that's popping up on your screen there. Just give me a quick click, uh, yes, no, not sure. And I'll read through our agenda pretty quickly, uh, really quickly here today. Uh, let's see, that's popping up on, hopefully that didn't wipe it off of everybody's screen, just my own. So today we're going to talk about mapping from experience, how to generate knowledge from people's, uh, collaboratively from people's experience. Uh, Bernadette is going to talk about how we do mapping to bring out knowledge from research studies and other materials. And then she'll talk about integrating knowledge from experience and studying. And this is, this is a very important uh, piece here because it helps us to bridge the gap between research and practice. And of course, at the end, we're going to have plenty of time for question and answers and discussions. And as Danielle mentioned, as we go along, please feel free to post your questions in the chat areas. If it's a quick clarifying question, we'll do our best to address it rapidly. Uh, for deeper questions, there'll be plenty of time at the end for Q&A. And I don't have the poll results on my screen. Yeah. So I, I have the result, the poll results here, Steve, and 69% uh, of people said yes, they have done some mapping, 24% said no, and 8% said unsure. Okay, very good. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, so most people have some experience in, in mapping, so this is going to be absolutely perfect for you because we're going to get into the very basics uh, but also point the direction towards uh, more complex mapping. And uh, let's, let's, let's throw out another quick poll there. Let's take it to a slightly deeper level. And let, let's ask, do you regularly use some sort of mapping process? Uh, just a quick yes or no poll. Uh, well, I explain this, you know, if, if you're familiar with the UC Denver's partner tool, you've got a really good head start for making those maps. And where the partner tool is great for mapping your people and your organizations, and importantly, the connections between them, today's presentation is focused more on mapping our knowledge, the interconnections between understandings and facts. And I did not see a pop-up. Uh, do we have the poll going to ask if people are regularly using a mapping process? Yes, the poll results just came up. 29% said yes, 64% said no, and 6% said unsure. Wow, interesting. Uh, just about the opposite of the previous. So most everybody's done it a little bit, but only a few people use it on a regular basis. Interesting. And here we're going to give you some very good reasons why you should do, use your mapping on a more regular basis and provide you the tools to make that mapping more effective. So this kind of mapping should be pretty familiar to you if you've been involved with making a logic model, workflow map, concept map, theory of change, or a visualization of your programs or strategies. And we like to think about these as Vis these, these visualizations of our understanding as maps because like a good roadmap, they do serve as a useful guide to help you navigate your organization, your network, where you want to go. And importantly, that navigation is not just a metaphor. A good map is concrete. It's not highly theoretical. And that's something that's new and different about the knowledge mapping we're, approach that we're going to be talking about today. Because unlike other methods, with this new approach, you can quantify how good your knowledge is and to see how your shared knowledge gets stronger as you gain more information and experience. So just a brief clarification uh, there, there's a distinction between data, which is, you know, just the facts, ma'am, uh, just the numbers. And the knowledge or understanding, which is the ability to use that data 
to make more effective decisions, to really influence your outcomes. So here we're talking about concrete mapping, not just some fuzzy sharing of experience and hope that somebody comes away from the, understand, from the conversation with an improved understanding. So let's jump into mapping from experience. And this is focused on collaborative mapping. That is making a diagram of the information and insights that you can find in your own expertise and by collaborating with others. So this is similar to, it starts out in a way that's similar to brainstorming or thinking out loud sessions where participants can create a shared knowledge map. Uh, for example, let's imagine a network of organizations interested in ending homelessness in their town. We'll call it End Homelessness in Our Town Network. And for a collaborative mapping session, the participants would bring together, you know, for example, officials from local government agencies, nonprofit leaders, business owners, regular citizens. All of the participants can place their insights on the map, and the resulting whole map becomes more useful to them all rather than, yeah, much more useful than any single perspective. So, you know collaboration is important, and that's why you're part of a network or looking to learn how to create more effective networks. And this is also important because more and more uh, government agencies and foundations are requiring collaboration as a condition for uh, awarding grant funding. And this kind of mapping process helps to show how you can connect your organizations and show those connections as part of the map. So this kind of collaborative mapping approach is becoming more and more pos uh, popular. Um, and collaborating, collaborative mapping is also an easy way to pull together perspectives of all the stakeholders, creating a map that's uh, you know, more useful and certainly more useful than uh, all the meetings you might attend and all the minutes that might be written up and all the post-its that you have to read. Much easier, in my humble opinion, to have it all laid out there on a nice, neat map. So let's start out with our uh, map here. Uh, we like to uh, write a destination for our map, and this is the ending homelessness in our town network map. And so let's just walk through the basics of collaborative mapping. Uh, this is a simplified, fictionalized example of the kind of maps we see uh, for organizations that are or are working towards being networked. So uh, each person that's part uh, of the collaborative effort takes turns adding circles and arrows to the map. And first up, it's Al. He's going to take his turn. And he places one thing on the map that he considers to be important in reaching the, de the destination. Al has placed affordability of housing as an important step. Um, now, just a bit of clarifying verbiage here. Uh, you, you might say that that affordability of housing is a variable, a node, a step, a bubble, a box, or today we're just going to call them circles and figure there's some sort of concept, idea, variable within the circles. Just easier that way. And each time a person adds something, uh, something to the map, everyone who's participating gets a chance to briefly ask questions and discuss it. We suggest a very short discussion. We like to limit it to about two minutes, you know, unless, of course, if there's something really substantive or, or serious going on. Also, we like to have everybody who's sitting around the table vote on each piece as it's placed because the voting process supports buy-in so that everybody sitting around the table knows that the majority of the people support the validity of the map. And this can be a formal raising, uh, a formal voting where people are raising their hand or just informally nodding heads around the table. And if the group agrees, good. If not, uh, maybe we want to set the circle aside for a future conversation. And we've facilitated this kind of mapping process with a wide range of organizations and coalitions, and everybody walks away with new insights that they haven't considered before. So it's a really neat process. And um, also, uh, one another interesting thing is I've, you know, I've done a lot of facilitation and training and that sort of thing. And using this kind of mapping process, 
we've seen amazingly little disagreement on making these maps when there's a few simple agreed upon rules. So uh, back to making the map. Um, next person is up. The map right now looks very small. It has one circle, affordability of housing. And next up is Ben. And Ben says, affordable housing construction projects are important. We, he's allowed to place one piece. Everybody uh, votes. They nod their heads and say, yeah, that looks like it's somewhat related to our overall map and our overall goal. And so we go forward to the next person. Now our map looks like it has two circles on it. Like I said, this is a very simple example. And next up is Carla. And Carla decides she wants to add a causal connection, showing that more affordable housing construction projects will lead to more affordable uh, housing. So here again, we're going to uh, do another quick poll. We're going to put you all, all of you participants who are listening now as members who are sitting around this very large virtual table, and we're going to ask you to vote. Does, uh, does that seem like a reasonable assertion there that more housing projects will lead to more affordability of housing? You should see a pop-up on your screen, and please uh, give me a quick yes or no or unsure. Bernadette, do we have some data from the poll? It just popped up. 63% uh, okay. yes, 25% unsure maybe, and 12% no. Interesting. If we did a follow-up poll, we could ask uh, why it's undecided. But most people sitting around the table would say that, yes, that seems to be a reasonable assertion there. It seems to be that the more affordable housing construction projects we'd have, the more affordable housing would be in our town. And similarly, the less affordable housing uh, construction projects, the less affordable the housing would be. But the unsure and maybe suggests that uh, Carla might want to explain that connection a little bit, just to clarify so that everybody understands exactly what we're talking about here. And also when we're making these maps, we're not looking for any one person or any one piece to contain all the answers, just asking if that one connection seems reasonable. So after each person has taken a turn adding something to the map, we start over with a new round. Everyone else takes another turn. And this ensures a more collaborative process and keeps one person from dominating the conversation or controlling the whole map. Um, the whole process usually takes about uh, two, three, four hours to get a good and useful map. Uh, another thing we found, it's very useful to have a facilitator. Uh, to help the sessions go smoothly, keeps the group from being derailed by having too much conversation, also by having too little conversation, because we want people to have a quick uh, back and forth to make sure that if something like this comes up that a chunk of people are unsure of, you know, we, we don't want the, the majority to dominate just because they're majority. We want to make sure the minority understands what's being added to the map also. Uh, another related point is that these kinds of maps have a pretty good shelf life. So once you've sat around the table and made your map, refer to it on you know at least a monthly basis to help with decision making and collaboration. And then, like every year, go back to the map and add to it. This is not something that is going to evaporate. Our, our understanding of situations change as the years go by and our understandings improve. So we want to add to our map to improve it, to make it more effective. So as you add to your map and as people take turns growing the map, you can end up with a map that looks kind of large and complex and confusing. Don't panic. Don't panic, and also don't try to read all the, the text within the map. Just kind of take it in a, as a gestalt. Um, it may, the map might look a little scary, but we're gonna talk about a few ways to make it easier for you and more useful. We recommend adding to the group, adding to the map, excuse me, until the group agrees that the map contains all the main ideas that are relevant for reaching the destination. And, 
the other important tip to making a good map is that there should be more than one arrow pointing towards each circle. And these rules support your planning and managing your program, uh, creating, sorry, these rules support creating a map that is more useful for planning and managing your program because like a good map, with more circles and more destinations, and the more arrows you have leading to those destinations, you can see the variety of opportunities or barriers that can affect the goals of your network. In short, the more complex the map, the more circles and the more arrows, the more interconnectedness, the more you understand how your network of understanding works and so the more effective a navigational tool it becomes. The map here has 20 circles. Seven of them have more than one arrow pointing towards them, which makes them more useful for understanding, for navigating, and those are the ones uh, with the yellow shadows or halos around them. And that's fewer than half of the total number of circles, so this group you know, has a little bit more to go. As I said, you can really quickly end up with a map that seems large and confusing, but don't panic because there's a few techniques you can use to make your map more manageable. Here we see a small part of that larger map. This shows the part that the Homeless Haven organization is working on, and they're looking this year to focus on getting more grant funding and donations, and with that funding, they're going to use that to support education and job training, construction projects, shelter availability, that sort of thing. Each organization and each person can focus on the piece of the map that shows what they will be implementing and hopefully what they'll be tracking or measuring that year. We like to do, uh, we like to uh, manage, track our variables. This makes the large map more manageable, but also you need the larger map to show where your particular efforts and your particular focus is gonna be connected with the focus of other people. Uh, and here, the green arrows again showing the positive causal relationship. Uh, more grant funding is gonna lead to more funding. Yes, it's a simple map. And the yellow circle, circles or the yellow shading shows that there's more than one arrow pointing towards it. So another trick to looking at your map, and this is sort of how to read a map, how to interpret your map. You want your map to have more reinforcing loops. These are also known as virtuous sign, virtuous, virtuous, <laughs> pardon me, new lips. Uh, these are known as virtuous cycles. These are connected circles where you can start from any one point on the circle and eventually end up in the map. Here we've got you know, community goodwill, goes to donations, which supports funding, which supports education, which supports employment, which supports business success, which goes back to goodwill. These loops show where an organization can place its efforts to create self-sustaining systems and continued growth. So if you have this kind of loop, you can expect managing this loop to lead you to a continued increase in donations and funding. Another trick to managing your map is to find circles that are part of two loops. On the left-hand side of the loop, uh, left-hand side of the screen here, you have sort of a business loop uh, where uh, we just, as we just described, where goodwill leads to funding, training, employment, and business success. On the right-hand side of the screen, you have the homeless haven funding loop where early detection of uh, mental issues or drug issues uh, will reduce the number of people who are at risk due to drug abuse, who will reduce the number of people uh, needing homelessness, which lead to more success stories, more community goodwill, more donations. So the three circles in the middle here with the black, which we've highlighted as black circles, homeless haven funding, donations, community goodwill, these are the key leverage points where you can focus your efforts to support both feedback loops. And this is tremendously important for developing collaboration between network organizations and for showing stakeholders and funders you know, where you're having really good uh, effect on the world. Another useful look, uh, tool for looking at the map is one of my favorites, finding the unknowns. Because a key purpose of this map 
is to improve your understanding. Now, it might be here, for example, we have, we have uh, on the lower right-hand corner, we have people at risk due to drug abuse. And to reduce that problem, we have more physical health care. We provide more behavioral health care. But you will notice on this map what is missing. Anytime there's a circle that has no halo, it has fewer than one, one or fewer arrows pointing towards it, there's something missing. So let's have a, a really quick... Um, a uh, poll here and now I'm missing my notes because I was having so much fun talking. Um, we wanted the, you, is there another poll? There, there was not a poll. I'm sorry. We, we missed, we messed up our, our presentation here. I'm afraid. Um, uh, we were going to have a, an interactive activity. Uh, so let's say uh, in the, in the chat room, a chat section or the Q and a section, um, can anyone see, this is a pop quiz here, double extra bonus points. What is missing on this map? And Bernadette, if you can uh, read some of that off to me, if you see, it, does somebody get it already? Who is ahead of the curve here? Well, like, what are some things that might lead to, uh, okay, okay, we have one answer, physical health care, behavioral health care, health care agencies. Very good. Yes, the more agencies we have working towards that, the more effective agency, the more effective the care will be. So, what this what this kind of map shows to you is that if also there are not two way connections, the link with the environment, errors going toward the solutions, Excellent. funding for these services, funding. Very good. I like I like this group. You're catching on very quickly. So, when you look at your map and you see these causal orphans hanging out here as we have with physical health care and behavioral health care you can see on your map that there is something missing there is some bit of something another circle that could feed into that or existing circles on the map that could be connected and these are opportunities for more research or for more collaboration and you can improve your map by adding more circles by adding more causal connections and here's a sample map a, a couple of a couple of other comments on on that that came in is um on the last slide bi-directional mm -hmm. links uh, i think an, another person said that too yes there, that would make another loop um, missing collaboration among the providers for the common problem very important and overarching policy is missing will connect both physical and behavioral health care awesome Awesome. Very good. One thing we have to watch out for, bi-directional arrows can be tricky. We want to make sure that they are uh, carefully researched, causal arrows, arrows. One thing we've seen people do is just say, oh, everything is connected. Well, yeah, maybe that's true, but it's also true that some things are more connected than others. So we want to make sure that our causal arrows are backed up by good research or generally accepted uh, wisdom. Uh, another key thing is we want our circles to maintain uh, very clear statements. For example, um, it's one thing to say that uh, if we have an overarching plan that will connect these two, but that's different than having a causal connection between them. It's better to say, for example, um, the more planning we have, the more connections we will have between the two, which will lead to uh, a reduction in people at risk, which is a very different thing to say than the better care we have, the fewer people we'll have at risk. Okay, so that's uh, very good for that. Um, so again, we have a, a sample map here of people sitting at a table and creating this. Uh, we found that a lot of people like the uh, cardstock uh, paper and markers approach. It's, it's very kinesthetic. People like to have their hands on things. And it's also great to have people meeting in person. Uh, this is from our Ask Matt a mapping process where a group of people sit around the table. Uh, it can also be run as a gamified approach, a serious play uh, that lets people make maps more quickly. 
we just uh, had a, a comment from one of our coaches that's a uh, new, new guy has just done one of these for a client. And he said that the, the client got more or the people working the map got more understanding in one hour of playing this game than they normally get from six or eight hours of sitting around talking, creating, um, you know, a, a, a um, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a right off the sorry, lips lips just gave out. Um, a uh, sorry, quick, Bernadette, save me. What was it? Um, a uh, SWOT analysis with a um, um, a knowledge statement or a, a value statement and a vision statement, uh, mission statement, those sorts of things. And also, the map can fit up on the wall nicely. Uh, whereas the visions and value statement tend to end up in a desk drawer. Um, also, this is a very easy approach for the facilitator. It's a, an out of the box approach. So there's our shameless plug for the day. Uh, moving on, we'll plug somebody else's work. Uh, for If you want a higher tech approach that's uh, also useful for making these kinds of maps online. Very useful for working with remote teams. You can use uh, uh, Kumu, K-U-M-U. -U. We find that's very nice and useful for, for making nice maps. Or Insight Maker. Um, this was very, we did this for our own business because uh, Bernadette's on the East Coast and I'm over here in California. And so it's very handy to, to just have an online platform where you can just put together uh, your, your maps as desired. Also very handy for sharing with the stakeholders. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Bernadette because evidently my lips are giving out and my throat is getting dry. And Bernadette will talk about mapping from experience. So let's see if we can do this handoff appropriately. Bernadette, are you, do you have control or shall I, let me try to send it um, over to you. Okay, I'll see if I do. Is that working for you now? And just, this is Danielle, just real quick. So while no, Bernadette's taking that over, if not. folks could be sure and, and go ahead and um, queue up your questions in the Q&A section, that'll help us kind of manage them for the end. I see a lot coming into the chat. Yeah. Um, so just click on the little Q&A box and we can get them in there. And then after Bernadette and Steve are, are done presenting, we'll go ahead and go through those. Um, so Bernadette, you just have to find your little bar that is either the top or bottom of your screen and hit your share screen. Yeah, and I, I, I handed over oh. to Bernadette so that oh, she can work I, if you want to try okay. to... I thought you were going to be advancing the slides. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, I can do that. that sure. Prepared. Okay. I can do that. You want me to take it back? Yes. Thank you. Let me see if I have it back here. Okay, there we go. So I want to make sure first that we have time to cover questions um, because I do see it. we're at 2.39 now. So do should, would it be a good idea to take questions now or do... Uh, talk about uh, other ways of making knowledge maps. Um, go ahead. Danielle? So Bernadette, I think you should um, maybe spend uh, at least the next um, maybe five to ten minutes see if you can get finished and then we'll have okay. ten to fifteen minutes at the end to do the questions. Okay. I think that'd be the most help best way to do it. Sounds great. Okay, so uh, in addition to the collaborative mapping approach that we just showed, Steve just went through, another way we can make a map is from interviews. So looking at that uh, on the next one, um, we can see that we, to, we interview people, we talk with people and ask them questions like, what do you see avoids helping being homeless in your world? And then they tell us their answer, like, well, from our perspective, we see that um, housing services helps people to transition out of being homelessness. And we record what they say in our interview notes or our transcripts, and from that we identify the, the causal statements in what people told us. And we can then diagram those causal statements uh, and th this shows uh, an example diagram we made using uh, the online system Kumu that Steve mentioned. So here, this lets us quickly see that one of the things that our interview participants said was that housing services helps people to transition out of homelessness. 
Um, for example, we might we might talk with people like uh, other service providers, people who are homeless themselves, and so on. So say we want, well, more information about what people actually said. You can set up with the online mapping software, you can set it up so you click on that arrow, and then that brings up this sidebar where you can see those details, like, well, how many interview participants said that. You can also get some example quotes from people that you might use in marketing or, or messaging. Then um, it, this, as we see uh, here on this slide, also you can, with the online map, uh, a, a nice technique is to make the larger circle show things that more people said and also wider arrows show things that we heard in more interviews. So that lets you immediately see the key th themes that people mentioned. So in addition to, um, let, let's bring up another poll. In, in addition to um, interviews and collaborative mapping, another way that a network might get information is from looking at the research and other related information. So who here has used and any or all of these sources of information in your work. Uh, academic studies, government report, professional conferences, webinars, blogs, industry publications, and any other source of information. Any of these can provi potentially provide valuable information that a network might apply. So thinking again about our end homelessness in our town network, we might look at sources of information that tell us about the issue of homelessness and promising strategies to address it. Okay, and um, it looks like we have 91% uh, of people use academic studies, 89% of people use government reports, 86% professional conferences, 83% webinars, 44% blogs, 64% industry publications, 47% uh, percent others, and fortunately, zero percent use none. Wow, okay, so you're familiar <laughs> with using research. So the, uh, first, we, we find relevant inf information that, uh, sources that contain information that we want to know. Then we identify causal connections in each study. So doing just a quick one minute search, I came across this study by Henwood et al. in 2015, and it contained the statement, the formula for providing a home for all is highly complex and requires collaboration. So we already knew collaboration was important. Now we have this research study to verify that. So then we can diagram that causal statement from the study. So this lets us immediately see that one thing, the research, where we have research studies is the idea that collaboration is important to leading to people being transitioned out of homelessness. So again, what if we want more details? We can click on that arrow and then that'll bring us up information about how many studies said that, who conducted those studies, so we can decide how much trust we want to put in that information. And we can also, again, see quotes from the studies that we might use for a grant application or messaging. And, and like, like with the interviews map, we can also uh, make an online map. Again, uh, we use Kumu for this example, where you have larger circles and wider arrows to show things that have more studies behind them. So this lets us quickly see where we have good, a lot of information. And then looking at the smaller circles, where we could probably use more research, things that were only mentioned in, in one study. So then we can integrate our maps from experience that we made from collaborative mapping, interviews, or both, and maps from research. So for this example, we'll integrate our map from the interviews and map from research studies from our example, Ending Homelessness Network. This kind of integrative map bridges the gap that we too often see between academia and practice. It lets us clearly see how the new information that we're collecting from local stakeholders relates to the broader information in the field. So in, in, the, in this example map, we can immediately see all the things that the interviews and the research studies said are helpful or a barrier to people transitioning out of homelessness. This is just a, a small example of 
the kind of thing that a map might show. So looking at the arrows, we can see which connections the interview participants mentioned, which, the, which connections the research studies mentioned, and which causal connections were mentioned in both our interviews and in past related research. So that, that shows where things that our local participants told us are, are confirmed with research studies. When, when you want to show what you're doing is based on evidence, you've got academic reports, but the studies don't always apply to your local situation. So these, these areas where we, that say interviews and research shows where the research studies do apply. So that, that let, this lets us make a map that is more complete, more realistic, and is going to be more useful for planning action. So to put everything all together, we, networks have several sources of information to make effective decisions, plan effective strategies, and demonstrate the value of what they're doing to funders and stakeholders. Collaboration and collaborative mapping techniques, interviews, and also we have uh, research studies. And we can make an integrative map to show our knowledge from any or all of these sources. That gives you a more complete and more realistic knowledge base. Program managers can use that integrated map to help them plan effective paths to reach their important goals because the integrated map lets you quickly see all the possible paths to get to where you want to go. So uh, back to you, Steve. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, so today we looked at the basics of network knowledge mapping. Uh, we've got a lot more information that we did not have time to cover. So if you want to learn more, you can find some white papers about these techniques on our website. The links are shown here. And you can also sign up for our email list, follow us on Twitter, all that good stuff. And when Danielle sends you the slideshow uh, and recording links, uh, she'll also send you a tip sheet to remind you of the key ideas. And of course, if any questions come up for you after the webinar, please send us an email. We'd like to hear from you and we're happy to help. So as promised, we've Terrific. saved some time for Q&A. Interested in hearing as many questions as possible. Danielle? Yeah, so thank you both so much. That was really great. And um, we do have a number of questions kind of queued up here. And um, one thing I just do want to remind everyone is that we will have the slides available also and the recording of this. So a few people have asked for that or said that they had to come and go. So, so that'll be available. So um, the, the first question here is, um, one, let me see how you all interpret this. Is it important to have someone who's not the boss be in charge of map creation? Yeah, uh, facilitation, I mean, in, unless you have the most enlightened boss in the world, uh, and even then it's difficult, <laughs> it's right? definitely useful to have a neutral person. Uh, the boss is the boss for a good reason, uh, but you want to, the whole purpose of a collaborative uh, approach is to bring out information and insights from everyone. Yeah. So um, a couple of questions are a little bit about software. Um, so I don't know if these are going to be familiar, but one person asked specifically, what are the benefits of using these programs versus a program like Visio? Um, yeah. Uh, I didn't know if that one's familiar, so okay. Yeah, if, if somebody wants to, to send us an email, uh, we have uh, done some research in this area, kind of sifting and sorting through the various uh, online platforms. Uh, for mapping. And we like these particularly because they give us a lot of flexibility. Uh, there are some out there that, for example, just let you draw arrows in one direction, um, you know, just let you create sort of a, a daisy petal uh, map, which is nice, but it does not allow the map to reach that level of complexity and interconnectedness that we need for our uh, complex uh, network organizations and understandings. Yeah, I, I would just add, we, um, you know, we found these two, to, we, we looked at several software options. We found these to be useful for our, our purposes. It doesn't mean that they'll be useful for you. It depends on your specific uh, situation. Yeah, and, and they're evolving. Great. Yeah. 
So, in, and in, in that line, um, a little bit, of, a couple of technical questions also. Um, so, the first one, do you, any of these technological services allow you to attach metadata? And they haven't, for example, the percentage of people who agree that there was a causal link, which we could later use in determining the strength of the relationship. And that? A absolutely. Yeah. The, like, uh, um, the things that I showed in these um, uh, screenshots from Kumu, like the, the way I, there's a, a description area and you can add any information you want that you, you can add fields uh, you can add numeric fields and you can, uh, th there's, there's a lot of things you can do with some, with the adva advanced features. You can cu customize. Uh, I know just from my experience with, with Kumu to show, uh, a lot of different types of information, certainly of effect size could be uh, one of those. Okay, and, and last one along those lines, um, and Bernadette, maybe it's, it's just the same answers, yes. Um, is there any way to integrate citation management software? Have you all done that by chance? Something, um, they, this, this person asked like Zotero as yeah, an example. I, I think know. of EndNote when I think of citation management yeah. software. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not aware of anything along those lines. I believe it has been done, but we've been focused on you know mapping knowledge rather than. I mean, it'll it can it, there can be, uh, for example, there are within the maps you can have links that link back to. Um, uh, for example, specific uh, survey results or specific publications, but I don't know about. Uh, anything that, for example, does citation counts, but that could, of course, you could do a map of those. Yeah. Yeah, I would have to, I would have to look in more into that. It, it's not something that, that I've um, looked into. Yeah. yeah. There's, it seems like a lot of folks have um, a lot of uh, thinking and questions about how to link different tools together to these maps. And um, I love these questions because it's where our mind goes to, and then we, we have to answer with the technological answer, you know, which is kind of clunky, right? Like, mm -hmm. we're not sure. It takes a little bit of work. <laughs> and how do we get them all to, to, to work together? We need our tools to collaborate as well as these people are collaborating, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes, so, um, so, Here's a couple questions about like using the tools and how it relates to our work. And so, um, and they might be similar, but you can, I'll let you all think about that. Um, this one asks, how does the collaborative network mapping account or inform project ownership? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's a good one. And that's one of the reasons we like this uh, mapping process is because usually, hopefully, it's the, the managers, the leaders, or the, the experts, or the people who are involved who are making the map, and they see uh, how their understanding links with other people's understandings to create new uh, insights and actions that they can do to work together. And so I'd say it is absolutely uh, powerful for ownership. Uh, we were working with one, and, and education as well, because we learn better when we understand things in a networked way. Uh, I facilitated a group uh, that was a, uh, a board of directors for a small nonprofit, and they had uh, half the people there were new to the board. And as the map grew, they suddenly said, oh, now we understand what's going on here. And so they were able to learn very quickly and become engaged more quickly with the organization as a whole. Yeah. Well, and along those lines, you know, this is always, right, the big question at the end of the day, but how do we move from maps to actionable decisions? And so this person has a for example. After collaborative mapping, how do you get to a plan as for what needs to get done by collaborating organizations? This is an excellent question, and this is one yeah. of our favorite parts of this kind. One of, the, one of the key rules we use for mapping is that each circle, each uh, concept that, that's placed on the map should be measurable. It should be something concrete. Uh, for example, if we're talking, you know, the number of homeless on the street, the number of meals provided, um, you know, the amount of funding. So when we look at these and the connection, the causal connections between them, we can see very clearly that, oh, we need more funding to uh, provide more meals, to help more people, these sorts of things. Okay, it's a very simplistic example. It's all we can do uh, in, in this kind of format. 
but when it is when the arrows represent causal relationships then those are instantly actionable then it and if it's not the the rule of thumb then is to sort of work backwards from the circle where you're at for example oh we just need funding to provide more meals well how do we get funding you know, we have to do these three things okay how do we do those three things and keep working the map backwards until you get to something that is easily actionable yeah also also each, each party involved would then take a, a piece of the map and and decide what which part they're going to focus on and then they could use that for you know th this is the piece of the map i'm going to be implementing and, and tracking yeah. so um let me ask this one um and i think it goes back to the content of your examples earlier um i think these might be even the one St the steve example you gave how do you address access versus quality of care issues in your thinking in these maps oh very good well each of those then let me see if i can back up the slides to what yeah. might have been that uh hmm. Yeah, this one came up about when you were about halfway through. Da, 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 somewhere. This is, this is, by the way, this is the fast instant replay for you. Um, yeah. um, so are we talking the bottom part of the screen here, perhaps, where we have physical health care, behavioral health care, people at risk? Um, so if we're talking about this sort of thing and you want to talk about access to health care compared to what was the other one? I'm sorry, short memory here. Um, quality, quality, access quality. versus quality. Yeah. Excellent. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Then those would be additional circles. So you could say, for example, more access to health care would support better health care. More quality of health care would lead to more health care. And those would be uh straightforward causal relationships that i think people would generally agree that those those would make sense that if you increase access you'll have better health care if you decrease access you'll have less health care so so simply taking those concepts writing them into the circles and placing them on the map and uh, adding those causal relationships uh, the causal arrows sounds like a good way to uh, improve the map yes and hopefully that answers the question, I hope. And, and yeah. as we, uh, that would be a question for a group in a collaborative planning session. The group yes. might say, hey, you know, this uh, health care, maybe that we need to break that all down into two separate circles or, you know, that, that's um, so it's best showing the the idea is for the map to show how people see things and how people are thinking of, of the issues. Yeah. Um, so we are getting just towards the end, and um, I just wanted to um, say that I think we'll just do one last question, and then if anyone else has other questions, um, you know, feel free to, to you know, maybe, um, Steve, you could put up actually your contact information and that slide while we're going kind of through the last thing so people can make sure they have a way to contact you. Um, so, and, and this one, I kind of, I, I'm reluctant to ask it. I feel like you might have already answered it, um, but it, it, it might be an easier one. Um, as you were going through almost a similar section, someone had asked um, about, you know, thinking about whether everything in the map eventually has to be in the loop, and otherwise, will there always be some, and this person said orphans. Um, so, if you could maybe just address that again, you know, in, in these maps, how you kind of include the boundaries of it, and, and who's in and who's not. Ooh, excellent question, because you, you start to grow these maps and you start to wonder, you know, does, does this expand on to ever? And will we ever stop making larger and uh, more complex maps? And the answer is uh, still ambiguous at the moment. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, the maps made by physicists are very simple and small. If you want to, if you want to understand the movement of electrons, you're going to have just a very small map of a few, uh, a few circles. If we want to understand what the heck is going on with you know, these intractable problems like homelessness and poverty, then we're going to need a large map. The scary thing is, is we don't really know how large a map we need yet. Right. 
um, we've, uh, what we do know is that from our studies or research and our experience is that the maps we typically make are not very well connected. We have a lot of you know, orphan concepts hanging out there, disconnected from everything else. Um, and as a result, and let me go back, we mentioned the development of integrative propositional analysis, IPA, where we evaluate the structure of the map on a scale of zero to one. What we find is that most maps that people use for strategic planning um, or, or policy analysis are around the 0.2 level. And most of them tend to be effective only about 20% of the time. And, and so, also, but for a, a really useful map, usually you have a core of some things that are well explained that do have two circles going to them. And then you have this broader knowledge of things that you know they're important, but they're not as, as explained. So gen generally, yes. that's what the, the effective maps that, that we see uh, look like. Yeah. So it's possible to improve our maps, and that's what we hope we can help you do today. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great way to end this. Um, thank you both so much. That was just a really great um, presentation, and I obviously it generated a, a ton of questions, and um, I'm sure we didn't get to everyone's questions. So be sure to note down the, this contact information, and um, I just want to say thank you. I think that we're all really appreciative of um, getting a chance to talk about connection and, and, and how we think about that, especially today. So. Thank you thank very, you very much. Thank you, you very both. much, Danielle and, and the University yeah. of Colorado. Yeah, and thanks everyone for attending, and we just hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, so we're going to go ahead and end there, and, um, and we just hope everyone stays in touch. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.